I just don't get it. Now, that's what my students used to say all the time once I would try to get done explaining transformations of functions. I would spend the whole lesson going over transformations and I would get ready to go right into the next lesson. Then there would always be that student and never fail. That student would always just raise their hand and say, I just don't get it. I don't understand transformations. I don't understand how they impact the graph. And so usually what I would do, I would stop, I would exhale. And I say, let me show you exactly how these transformations work. No matter how the lesson might've gone, I'd usually go back to an explanation just like this. Now to understand transformations, I think it's really, really important for us to understand a function that we're very familiar with. And yes, that is the quadratic function, the parabola, the U-shaped graph. Now, this is the parent graph of the quadratic. And what we want to do is just kind of go over the different types of transformations that you might remember or you might not remember. But it's very important for us to be able to distinguish how these transformations impact this graph and also how some transformations don't impact this graph. Let's go and take a look at some of these basic transformations so we can understand the more complicated version of transformations. So what I've done is I've applied some transformations to these functions. I've either multiplied them or added them by a number. Now, it's very important for us to also recognize that two of these functions have parentheses and the others do not. Now, why are we using parentheses? And the reason why we're using parentheses is because just like the operations, how there's either multiplication or addition, it's very important to be able to understand is our operation inside or outside the function. So we can write our function f of x equals x squared just like this. We can also write it just like this with parentheses. Importance of using parentheses is that it tells us if something's inside or outside. You can think of the parentheses as like the wall on the house. Everything inside those walls is obviously inside the function and anything on the outside is gonna be outside the function. And the reason why this is important is because depending on the operation, if it's inside or outside, is going to change how that transformation impacts the graph, just like addition versus subtraction. So let's go back and review these. You might already know all of these, but again, trust me, this is very important as we build up our understanding of transformations. Now, in addition to reviewing these transformations, I'm also going to justify these by using a value of the graph. And the value that we're gonna use is two. So again, remember when we want to evaluate functions, I could just plug two in for X and I could get a value on the out. So when I plug in two, I'm going to get four. Now, when I talk about the transformations, I want to justify those transformations with this point f of two. In this first example, you can see that I'm multiplying a one half outside the function, right? Because there's no parentheses. So we can assume it is being outside. Also, we notice that one half is less than one. So whenever we're multiplying on the outside by a value that is less than one, but greater than zero, that is going to be a vertical compression. It's actually taking this graph and compressing it down. We can also verify this by finding the value of two. We know the regular parent graph has a value of a four, but if we compress it, it should be lower than four. So if I go ahead and plug in this value, so f of two, equals a one half times two squared. Now again, remember use order of operations, two squared is four, four times one half is going to equal two. And you can see at two points over, I'm only gonna go up to two, although instead of up to four. So therefore this graph is just a little bit more compressed vertically. Now in the next example, I'm still multiplying on the outside, but instead of the value being less than one, it's now larger than one. So if it's less than one, it was a vertical compression. Hopefully you start to recognize that if it's larger than one, it's going to be a vertical stretch. And exactly, you can think of it this just like a rubber band of stretching this function. But again, let's go ahead and verify. So if I plug in two, I'm going to have a two times two squared. Well, two times two is four times two is going to be eight. Now I don't even have the ability to draw eight up on this graph, but hopefully you guys can see that this graph is going to be very much here stretched on this inside. The next example is now I have a number that's less than one. Now again, be careful. This is a negative outside of the function. It's not inside. Now, assuming I don't know what this is going to do, let's go ahead and plug in the two and see what happens. Now again, remember when I'm plugging in this two, the two is going to be the only thing that's going to be squared because the negative is on the outside of the walls. So therefore I have a two squared, which is four. So this ends up being a negative four. So when I go over two, I'm actually going down four and then to down four. So you can see what this graph, what's happening to this graph is this graph is being reflected about the x-axis. Now, the last one is now let's go and get away from multiplication. Let's look at addition because one thing I want you to know with all this multiplication, all that's done is stretched, compressed, or reflected. Notice the vertex of the parabola. It is not changed. It's just stretched, compressed, or reflected. But once I get into addition, this is all about to change. If we plug in our point f of two here, again, we're going to have a two quantity squared plus one, which is gonna equal five. Unfortunately, that's not a vertical stretch to get us to five. What that's actually doing is that's gonna be a vertical shift up one. So when we're adding outside of the function, that's gonna be shifting the graph 
up that number of units. So in this example, our graph is gonna look like this. And it's gonna take the same shape as the parent graph, just like our first and the last previous example. It's very important for us to understand something as we look at this graph right now. Notice all the transformations that have been applied. Nothing has impacted the graph horizontally. Everything that has impacted this graph has been a vertical transformation. That is so important to recognize because all the transformations that we have done up to this point have all been outside of the function. That's why when we have outside operations, those impact the graph vertically. Now let's go and take a look at our next two examples, which are gonna impact the graph horizontally. So in this example, I have an X plus one. Now, when we added a one on the outside of the graph, that shifted the graph up. So hopefully you recognize since it's inside the walls, this should shift the graph left or right. So X plus one, well, where is it going? A lot of students would think, well, it has to be going to the right, right? I mean, that kind of makes the most amount of sense, but guess what? It's actually going to the left. And I'll explain this a little more later on in the video. But if right now, let's just go and verify the point that's actually being shifted left or right. So if I go ahead and plug in a F of two, what I'm going to have here is a two plus one, quantity squared. Well, two plus one is three, three squared is going to be a nine. So over two, I'm going to be again going up nine, which is shifting the graph really, really high. Now, again, this graph is going to look something a little bit different, but it's going to look something like this. And it's going to get up to that nine very quickly. So in this example, if I'm going to multiply by negative on the inside, that's going to be a horizontal reflection. I know I've kind of messied up this graph, but look at this white graph here. If I reflect this horizontally, guess what I'm going to do? I'm gonna produce the exact same graph. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, when we first introduce transformations, we don't do a lot of inside the function. The only thing we really will talk about is the shifting it left or right, because the quadratic function is symmetrical about the y-axis. So a lot of the operations inside the function, we're not gonna very easily be able to understand. So understand the inside transformations a little bit better. Let's go ahead and take a look at our next function, which is the square root function. So here's the square root function and its graph. Unlike the quadratic function, you can see this graph is only has positive value. How the transformations impact the quadratic are gonna be the exact same for how they impact the square root function. Now, in this example, we don't really need to use parentheses because what we kind of have is like a little bit of a roof, right? Kind of like the outside of the house, you know, we have these walls and you can kind of think about this, this little square root as a roof. So anything under the radical sign, we are going to consider as inside the function. Anything on the outside, we're gonna consider outside outside the function. Now where the quadratic equation wasn't really great to be able to differentiate between inside and outside transformations, this function is perfect for us to really see the difference between inside and outside transformations. So I'm gonna do a couple more examples for us to be able to see how our graph is going to be impacted. All right, so you can see there's a difference here. We have operations outside, we have operations inside. We have multiplication and we have adding a negative number, also known as subtraction. But again, I'm changing up the operations as well as if the transformation is inside or outside to really let you see how our graph is going to be impacted. Now, I also wanna go and take a look at a value. So therefore we can make sure our transformations are indeed correct. And that value we're gonna check in this case is going to be four. So if I plug in F of four into this function, I'll have the square root of four. And the square root of four here is just going to be a two. All right, so hopefully you remember on the last example, we had fx equals one half x. That should be horizontally compressing the graph, right? So if I plug in a f of four, I'll have a one half times the square root of four. Well, the square root of four is two and one half times two is just going to be a one. You can see here at four, one, two, three, four, we're gonna go at one and you can see indeed that graph is being horizontally compressed. Now, in the next example, I move the one half inside the radical. Now, hopefully you understand that that is now horizontally transforming the graph. And where a lot of students will make their mistake is they think, well, if one half is outside, that vertically compresses it. So if it's a one half on the inside, that horizontally compresses it. It makes sense, right? But let's go ahead and take a look so we can see. When I go ahead and plug in F of four here, because again, this is inside, so it's a horizontal transformation, I'm gonna have the square root of one half times four which is going to be the square root of two, which is approximately 1.41. So when I go ahead and plot this on this graph here, it's gonna be 1.41 is between one and two, right? So it's gonna be somewhere in there. Now, I wouldn't really say that that is actually a horizontal compression, because if it was a horizontal compression, the graph would probably be somewhere around in here. This is actually a, is a horizontal stretch. So when we multiply on the inside of a function by a number that's between zero and one, it's actually a horizontal stretch. It's the exact opposite if we were doing that on the outside of the graph. So let's go and take another example for numbers that are larger than one. See in the next example, I have a four, which is going to be a vertical stretch because right, the four is larger than a one. And again, let's go ahead and plug it in. So if I plug in a f of four, 
what exactly I have is a four times the square root of four. Well, the square root of four is again two, two times four is equal to eight. So at four, I'm up to one, two, three, four, five. That's really, really high up there, right? One, two, three, four, five. So really, really high. So if I was to graph this, I at least know that two is going to be at eight. At one, we could also be at four. So this graph is gonna look way up here and I'm not even gonna be able to get to that high because it's gonna be very, very high, very high vertical stretched. But now let's go and take a look at, well, what about if I multiply by four on the inside? Is that going to be a horizontal stretch or that kind of looks like a horizontal compression as well? Is it exactly the same? So when I plug in a F of four, what I get here is a four times four. Well, four times four is 16, which is equal to a four. So over one, two, three, four, I'm up at one, two, three, four. So what I want you to understand is the vertical compression is not the same as the vertical stretch. All right, so it's very important for us to take away something right now, that whatever happens on the inside is not the same as what happens on the outside. And if I am vertically stretching something, that's not the exact same as a horizontal compression. You can see exactly here, if I multiply by four, I highly vertically compress the graph. When I multiply by four outside the graph, I highly vertically stretch the graph. But when I multiply by four on the inside of the graph, I am compressing it. It's very similar, but it's not exactly the same. So don't confuse those two. And make sure you remember when you multiply by four on the outside, that's a vertical stretch, but multiplying by four on the inside, that is going to be a horizontal compression. And now again, there's no better way that we can differentiate if it's vertical or horizontal than is the operation inside or outside. And when you're multiplying by negative or a number that's less than zero, remember that's going to be a reflection. You can see in this case, my function is being multiplied by negative on the outside. So therefore I already know this is a vertical reflection. It's going to be reflected about the X axis. But again, let's go and take a look here. So I'll have F of four equals a negative square root of four. Well, the square root of four is two, which is going to be a negative two. So the graph going up, it's now going to go down. And if we go ahead and take a look at this next example, you can see I'm multiplying my negative on the inside. So therefore that's going to be a horizontal reflection. And again, to prove my point here, if I have a F of four, you can see here, that's going to be square root of negative four. Now we can't take the square root of negative four, right? So what exactly is going on here? Why is four not in my domain, right? That's an imaginary number. Now some students might be confused, but if you've been following me through this video, kudos by the way, then you should know this is a reflection not about the x-axis, but a reflection about the y-axis. So therefore this graph actually looks like this. So this graph does not contain a four. It only contains only negative numbers. So now we can go beyond just knowing the values of the graph and actually rely on knowing our transformations. In this next example, you can see we're changing up our operation from multiplication to subtraction. Now, in addition, let's shift the graph up. So when we're going to do subtraction in this example, we're going to shift the graph down. Since we're subtracting outside the function, see it's not under the roof, we're going to move the graph down three units. And again, let's just check our answer here. So if I had f of four, that's going to be the square root of four minus three. So the square root of four is two, two minus three is going to equal a negative one. So at four, we have negative one and you go down three and you can see the graph is going to look something like that. It's just a vertical shift down. And then if I want to subtract a three under the roof, we know that's going to be horizontal, right? So again, this is going to be shifting the graph right. Now, again, if you remember from quadratics, a lot of people were like, plus one, why are you going to the left? And shouldn't it be to the right? Well, again, let's just go and take a look at this one. If I'm going to be X minus three, that's three units to the right. It's not three units to the left. And again, we can show this by plugging in our value of F of four. When I plug in F of four, I have the square root of four minus three right? This is all under radical. Four minus three is one. The square root of one is just going to equal one. So if I take this graph, right, this white graph here, and I'm going to be shifting it over three units to the right, you can see here how this graph is going to cross the point four comma one, right? Because again, this is the point four comma one. If we were to shift this graph three units to the left, like I know so many of you want to do, if you were to shift this graph, this white graph, three units to the left, one, two, three, you would have the graph that's gonna look something like this. Does that graph look like it's ever gonna cross the point four comma one? No, but I hopefully you guys recognize that this point is not incorrect. When I plug in four, I get one. So you can see that we are indeed correct. When I have X minus three, that is gonna be shifting the graph three units to the right. So we're all good, right? That's all we really need to know about transformations. Anything outside the function is going to be affecting the graph vertically. Anything inside the function is going to be affecting the graph horizontally. So we can basically summarize everything just like this.
Ooh, that is a lot. And that's basically a summary of everything we just did in those last two examples. But don't worry, it gets worse than this. There's one thing that I did not address yet, and it's probably the one that gets students the most confused that you are going to need to know in future math courses. That is when we have a B and a C. Now that is because a lot of times equations are written in this format, but in reality, we need to use an extra set of parentheses because when we have a B and a C, we need to make sure we write it just like this. Now you can see here, the B is still inside the function, right? It's inside the parentheses, the walls of our house. However, I'm separating it from the C. And if you don't already have it separated, you have an equation written like this. The first thing you're going to want to do is factor out the B because when you have the B factored out, we can talk about the B separately from the C. Now let me show you two last examples where I can really highlight this understanding. And it's very important though, to understand when we're dealing with transformations or we're understanding our B and our C, make sure we're dealing with it in this form and not this form. Now here are two examples where you can see we have a B and a C. In this case, we have a B, which is two, and a C, which is a four. Now, a lot of students will say, oh, well, that's going to be a horizontal compression of two, and we're shifting the graph four units to the right. Based on what we learned last time, that would be a good answer. However, when we have the B and the C, we have to factor out that B to accurately understand what the transformations are. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna rewrite this by factoring out a two. So I can factor out the two from the two X, which is just gonna leave me with an X, and I can factor a two from a negative four, which is gonna give me a negative two. Now, I'm just gonna use my double parentheses here to show this is two times X minus two quantity squared. So we still have everything inside the walls, but the important thing I want you to understand is I'm not shifting the graph four units to the right, I'm only shifting the graph two units to the right. I still have this horizontal compression of two in both these forms, but the transformation is different. And to prove that we're only shifting the graph two units to the right, let's go and take a look back at our parent graph. If I had fx equals x squared and I plugged in f of zero, then we know that that answer would be zero squared, which is zero, because that is the vertex of the graph. Now, if I plug in two and this graph is only being shifted two units to the right and stretched, it should not move up or down. So therefore, when I plug in two, I should get zero as my output. Let's go ahead and plug in a two. So when I plug in a two into this new function, what I have here is a two times two minus four. Well, two times two is four, four minus four is zero, zero squared is zero. So you can see indeed that yes, even the graph is being horizontally compressed, it's only being shifted two units to the right. It's not being shifted four units to the right. Let's go and take a look at one more example so you can see how this works. Now, a lot of students would look at this graph and say, I have no idea what the transformations are. So again, let's write it into the B times X minus C. So what I can do is I can rewrite the negative X plus one, then I can factor out the negative. When doing that, I'm gonna get a minus here. This is all under the radical from there. So I have a minus times the X plus one. So now we can see we're multiplying by negative, which is reflecting about the Y axis, and we're shifting the graph one unit to the right. So again, to go ahead and take a look at this graph, let's go ahead and take a quick sketch of what the graph would look like. Now let's go ahead and verify this is one unit to the right. So you can see how this little endpoint is at zero, zero. So if I'm gonna shift this one unit to the right, that means my new endpoint should be right there. So let's go and plug in F of one. So if I plug in F of one, what I have here is the square root of a negative one minus one. Now one minus one is zero times a negative is zero. And the square root of zero is just going to be zero. So you can see that works exactly right there. And yes, we know the graph is reflected about the y-axis, so it's gonna be shifting one unit to the left, and it's gonna look something just like that. Now again, you could plug in another number if you really wanted to, right? What if we plugged in negative three? Let's just double check this. Negative three minus one is going to be a negative four. Negative four times a negative is a positive four. Square root of positive four is two. So at negative three, one, two, three, we're at positive two. And you can see that a point is verified right there. All right, guys, I have many more examples on transformations of functions and identifying the transformations down below, or you can go ahead and check out my next video right here. Cheers.